my dear friend, Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski joins us now. Colonel Karen, thank you very much uh, for its your time and welcome back to the show. Uh, in the past uh, two or three weeks, Congress has done some rather uh, unusual things. Uh, it censured uh, a member of the House of Representatives for singing a song and it uh, condemned uh, an undefined concept of anti-Semitism, very, very minor uh, dissents in both. In fact, the anti-Semitism uh, condemnation only had one dissent, the very uh, courageous and constitution-embracing Congressman Thomas Massey uh, of Kentucky. You have written a piece at lewrockwell.com that eviscerates what uh, Congress did. Um, I want to talk to you about Israel and Ukraine, but I'm fascinated with this uh, piece. What business is it of the government defining terms and condemning them? The government produces more hatred than any other entity on the planet. Yeah, well, they don't have any business doing it, and they don't do it very well. <laughs> so clearly, um, it's it's kind of, I guess, virtue signaling. Um, who are they signaling it to? I don't know. I, I kind of suspect uh, who, who it's being directed at. It's a huge waste of government time. And I didn't put it in the article, but, you know, you think about all the other things that Congress uh, might be dealing with right now. And um, what, what they're spending time on the most idiotic things, uh, which, which, again, they shouldn't be doing. So when Congress uses a phrase like anti-Semitism and doesn't define it and forgets <laughs> that the Arab people are Semites and most of the Israelis are Ashkenazi and not Semites, this is a little <laughs> bit of hair splitting, but they started it. We didn't. Um, what purpose is served by Congress putting its thumb uh, on the scale of the use of words in public? This is the same Congress that condemned college presidents for not speaking out on college campuses. I didn't think Congress is in a position to tell people that they have to speak. The right to silence is guaranteed mm -hmm. by the First Amendment as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. They, they apparently don't look at the Constitution very closely. They could just stop at the first. They don't pay attention to it at all. Um, but I think with, with what they did with this uh, uh, defining anti-Semitism in a certain way and, and uh, really uh, conflating anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism as if they are the same, it really makes them look bad, first off, because anybody with half a brain who has done any research at all understands that the Congress is wrong in what they have put in their, uh, their proclamation. Uh, but, you know, they, they are sending a message uh, to the American people, of course, that you can't say anything, you're going to get in trouble. But they're also bending the knee to their pro-Zionist uh, funders of their campaigns. Please don't run a primary candidate against me. I'm as loyal to you, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Donor, uh, you know, as, as I've ever been, and even more so. And see, here's my language, and I wouldn't dare vote against it. Uh, and of course, only one, as you pointed out, um, Congressman Thomas Massey did vote against it. So uh, clearly, they're, they're uh, you know, the, the Congress is pretty well controlled. And the question is, who is it controlled by? Because it's supposed to be controlled by the people, um, but it doesn't look like it is. And this is a this this particular proclamation had all the characteristics of a typical congressional product, which does not serve the American people at all. Does the Congress bother to define anti-Semitism, or to members of Congress, does that mean anybody that disagrees with the Netanyahu government? Well, I mean, it does mean that because Zionism is a political construct. The president or the prime minister, the government of Israel is a Zionist government. That, that's the whole kind of how it works. And um, we are allowed to criticize that government, which is actually pretty concerning because I think many in Congress see that government is just like our government. And apparently we're probably, I may be reading too much into this, but I don't think we're supposed to criticize our government either. Um, I think maybe they're sending us that little message, but we'll see. Well, I mean, the whole purpose of the First Amendment is to keep the government out of the business of speech. So for the government to point its finger at the presidents of Ivy League schools, how dare you allow this demonstration on campus and not resist it? Who the hell is the government to tell the head of a private uh, university 
how okay. she should be dealing with a de with a demonstration on campus. She can use words. She can use indifference. She can use silence. She doesn't have to tailor her words to please the government. She doesn't have to answer questions from the government about what words she uses. I mean, yeah. whatever became of the freedom of speech? No, we don't have any. And and I think you know what what could it, you can imagine the Congress reacting to their anger particular anger about these uh, three college presidents and they didn't like what they said or what they tolerated or whatever. I could see individual congressmen or senators standing up and using their five minutes or however long they have and really lambasting them. And I'm sure they've done some of that and really standing up for something that they personally believe in. But when they put together like this document that the, that the house put together and approved, when they put together a document that says, uh, we're all too chicken to really say what we think. Most of us are too stupid to understand what the First Amendment has in it. And we don't understand our role vis-a-vis -vis the First Amendment. But granted all that, really just, we're afraid. Tell us what we should say and we'll we'll all sign on to it. And that way, none of us have to think. None of us have to uh, abide by the law. None of us, certainly none of us have to stand up for the Constitution um, that's it's it's the easy lazy person's way out, and that's what our that's what our government does. I mean, that's what they do with their limited and valuable time. You know, we have right. we have you know so many problems that they should be dealing with, or could be dealing with. But what do they choose to do? They choose to hide from their responsibility. Let's let's put together a document that pleases another country's government, and and our donors, and we'll all sign up to it and silence anybody who says different. And then we've, we've filled that square. We have done our duty. Well, they haven't done their duty at all, not in any way, shape, or form. You know, uh, there's a, an instrument that judges have when they're trying to figure out what a statute means called legislative history. And you look at what members of Congress, or if it's the state uh, law, the state legislature, said about the statute at the time they proposed it, amended it, and voted for it. My late great friend, Justice Scalia, used to say, legislative history is garbage. I don't care what they said about it when they voted for it. There's only one reason, one reason under the sun why they vote for anything, to get reelected. And that's really why they do things like condemn something that their patrons want condemned, because they want to get reelected. They want the votes and they want the financial support from the people who want to hear this. It has nothing to do with lawmaking. It's in direct violation mm -hmm. uh, of the First Amendment. It's hardly inappropriate. It violates the spirit of why we have uh, a legislature telling us what words we can use and ideas we can express, but they do it anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, what, what is gained internationally or politically or militarily by the United States being wedded uh, at the hip to Israel? What is gained by the United States? How is American, Nash, if at all, American national security enhanced by this relationship? Well, I think there's reasons that they say that it is, but in my lifetime, in looking at, at the relationship and how it has worked out for us in a number of ways in the past 35 years, it seems like um, it doesn't help us at all. And that's why I think people question it because, you know, we, we have this idea or we hear it from the government that it's democracy. It's, it's a democracy in the middle of the Middle East. It's our little vanguard state that protects something from terrible things happening. But in fact, we trade and we manipulate governments all over the Middle East. Um, the one we can't manipulate as well as maybe the American people might want to is the government of Israel. They, in fact, manipulate our government. So I don't see where that's an advantage. Um, certainly what's good for Israel in its context is cannot always be good for the United States. Um, it doesn't go that it doesn't it doesn't work that way. So um, I see it's very dangerous. Now, certainly, you know, you could think about the U.S. liberty. That's physically dangerous for us. We had a spy ship during the what was the 1967 war and we were attacked by the Israeli Air Force and the Israeli Navy for a long period of time, several hours, um, to the extent of even shooting our, our survivors in the water. Okay, so uh, the ship didn't sink, thank God, but the whole thing was covered up by uh, LBJ and others. So that to me reflects uh, the danger. 
of being so-called friends with somebody who really is not your friend. And of course, I believe that it's just common interests. I don't believe in friendships between uh, states, between organizational entities. There's just interests. So um, there, have, there have been times certainly when our interests with Israel are, are the same, but for the most part, they're not the same. And right now we're getting, forget the, it's terrible what's happening in Gaza. And that, that is a very uh, awful thing. The whole world is, is angry, upset about it. But think about um, the other uh, aspects of uh, things, things that Israel has done that really drag us down. Um, Chris is, so hang on a second, Karen. Chris is running the website oh, uh, of APAC. Goodness. And this lists Republicans <laughs> and Democrats and how you can donate to them directly through the APAC website. So these are people who voted the way the American uh, Israeli Political Action Committee, which is really a, a lobbyist for a foreign government unregistered with the yeah. DOJ, um, wants you to uh, or, or appreciates how they voted. Absolutely. There are just and hundreds of members of Congress there on both parties. have been running this for two and a half minutes now. We're only up to the letter E in the alphabet. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, you know, again, uh, you know, APEC, prime example. Is APEC good for America or not good for America? Well, it's an Israeli lobbyist. So its interest is not to be good for America. Its interest is to be good for Israel. And so when we embrace that and when we refuse to uh, treat it as a uh, foreign entity, and, and apply the normal rules that we have for all other similar organizations, we lose. So that's just one tiny example. Well, it's a big example, but there are so many other ways where by us blindly joined at the hip or lockstep with, with Israel and whatever government they have and whatever that government chooses to do and how it behaves, every bit of that reflects badly on us for the most part. And I think about the nuclear situation. You know, we are a country that, uh, you know, we complained when, you know, people back out of treaties of, of and people won't allow inspections of nuclear uh, materials. You know, we're always on somebody's case about that. But we were completely silent on in the case of Israel on their nuclear weapons. So what that does for us, the United States, is proves that we are a hypocrite in this area. Um, people don't like hypocrites and they don't trust hypocrites. So we, the United States, don't get a benefit from our close alliance with Israel with vis-a-vis -vis the, the, their nuclear weapons. That's how just one has, example. How has our alliance with Israel isolated the United States uh, internationally? I mean, our, our friends, the Brits, who are like um, poodles to us, didn't vote against the uh, resolution at the Security Council calling for a ceasefire, but they abstained. Uh, the United States voted uh, against. We'll play the clips in a minute, and you can give us your opinions on what various ambassadors had to say about this. But doesn't this uh, isolate us to our uh, detriment? The, the manner in which the Israeli government uh, is killing innocents, it's now up to 18,000, 18,000 civilians dead in Gaza, uh, and it's doing so with abandon. It's doing so admittedly. And it's doing so with American weapons. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and even the West Bank, the latest news of, on Zero Edge, you know, an article about our white phosphorus weapons with the track the serial numbers right back to the United States and they, they named the company that they were made in and the year that they were manufactured in our country being dropped on West Bank because they're also at war in the West Bank as well as Gaza. Um, so, yeah. Well, it makes using, us using phosphorus is by definition... Uh, a war crime because that's a, it? it's a chemical uh, weapon. So phosphorus made in the United States, authorized by the United States government, sold to the Israeli government, paid for by the United States government, used by the Netanyahu regime uh, on civilians. What's well, the definition of a war crime? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, our, our veto which would be interesting to <laughs> see what people are saying about that. But, but you know, we, we have no credibility globally. Uh, to the extent that we had some prior to uh, October 7th, we certainly have lost and squandered whatever was left. Uh, we are the ultimate uh, international hypocrite. Chris, play uh, the uh, two clips. Uh, so, Karen, the first clip is Robert Wood, whom I didn't know until I heard saw this clip. 
He's the deputy U.S. ambassador to the U.N., or obviously did what the State Department told him to do, giving uh, a one or two line defense. And then there's a very uh, interesting uh, set of observations from uh, a Middle Eastern prime minister uh, and two uh, foreign ministers who were in D.C. at the time this happened, and they uh, responded immediately and extemporaneously. We'll play both clips for you now. Although the United States strongly supports a durable peace in which both Israelis and Palestinians can live in peace and security, we do not support this resolution's call for an unsustainable ceasefire that will only plant the seeds for the next war. We believe there is a moral obligation toward the international community to stop the killing of the civilian, Palestinian civilians. And it's the first time, at least in my lifetime, that I have seen that calling for a ceasefire became a controversial issue. I'm not sure how deep is the understanding here of what's happening on the ground in Gaza. Uh, I mean, this war has broken every record. Uh, largest number of journalists killed, largest number of, of, of hospitals destroyed, last, largest number of medics killed, largest number of UN uh, employees killed. Our message has been very clear. There needs to be uh, an immediate ceasefire, there needs to be a cessation of hostilities, and uh, we need to have immediate access for humanitarian aid. It is not acceptable. So the uh, ceasefire was um, was vetoed under the UN rules. You know, any one of the permanent members of the Security Council, of which the U.S. is one, can veto it. As we speak, it's being debated in the General Assembly. It's it's moot, other than the political implication. But my point is the isolation of American diplomats, the lack of credibility uh, in the American government as perceived by foreign governments could have a detrimental and long-term effect on us. We haven't even talked about Hezbollah and whether the U.S. is going to get involved and whether Iran's going to get involved. Um, Joe Biden is threatening U.S. troops in Ukraine, not in, uh, in Israel. I'm just talking about the diplomatic detriment to uh, America's complicity in war crimes, Karen. Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what we're seeing on the grand stage. Um, and I think, I mean, I wonder how these diplomats sleep at night with um, by being willing to speak uh, the lies of our government or the excuses for uh, the, the position that our government has. And it's, you know, the best thing they could come up with is we don't want to. We don't want to have a ceasefire because that will plant the seeds for the next war. Are they insane? Because <laughs> what they're doing is planting the seeds for a world war, um, and apparently that we're okay with that. Apparently, our State Department, our UN ambassadors are are just fine with that. Um, it's it's really shocking the disconnect and then the lack of morality that we're seeing in our own uh, representatives. Uh, switching gears to Ukraine, as we speak, uh, President Zelensky. Uh, is on Capitol Hill. He's in the Capitol building. This is just a few minutes ago, uh, Karen. President Zelensky with Senator Chuck Schumer, a Democratic leader in the Senate, and Senator Mitch McConnell, Republican leader in the Senate. So you have the two leaders of the two parties in the Senate, both lockstep. <laughs> Funny, they're walking in lockstep, but, but I mean, they're political lockstep uh, with the uh, president wanting to give $68 billion with a B, uh, to uh, Ukraine. Uh, most of the world recognizes that Ukraine has lost the war, that the government is uh, collapsing, that uh, elections have been canceled, that the border has been sealed so people can't leave to avoid the draft. Uh, and yet uh, Biden and company um, want to give $68 uh, billion to him. Do you think that the neocons have recognized that uh, this was one of their more colossal blunders and they've lost well, I, I do think I do think that the uh, I mean even the Atlantic Council, which is a neoconservative think tank, has been saying that it is not it that, that it's a loss. It is not uh, uh, Ukraine is a nat nation now has new borders. They are smaller. Uh, that the country is impoverished and is broken, and the war needs to end so they can rebuild. That's that's the neocon word now. But I think uh, to, to think that the neocons um, as a, as a small group or as individual human beings who, who believe uh, in, in what they do and what they advocate, I think they 
uh, never, they're never wrong. They always see the plus in this and they will go to their graves saying that every penny we spent in Ukraine was wonderful because it harmed, it harmed Russia. And it, it was a, a, an expansion against uh, the evil Russians who want to come all the way to, I don't know, France or Spain, wherever it is they think the Russians want to come to. And uh, so they'll, they'll, they're not going to say they're sorry. They never say they're sorry. They never say they're wrong. And it's actually, uh, if it wasn't so, you know, sociopathic, it would be admirable how, how firm they are in their beliefs. But um, yeah, they're not gonna, they're not gonna say it. They'll spin it a different way. Um, and I actually don't think, I don't, I haven't heard neocons strongly advocating for this 68 billion to be approved for Ukraine. I think that they, to, to, a, to a person, they have uh, recognized that that money should probably be given to uh, either Israel or uh, to their next project. Your next project after Israel will probably be Taiwan. Uh, I want yeah. you to uh, listen to two um, statements from President Biden. One is uh, last July, July 13th, and one is last week, December 6th. And the first one, he said, Putin has lost in Ukraine. And the second one, he says, well, if Putin wins in Ukraine, we might end up fighting the Russians. This is absurd, but this is the president of the United States. Watch the uh, issue of whether or not uh, um, this is going to keep Putin from continuing to fight, the answer is Putin's already lost the war. Putin has a real problem. How does he move from here? What does he do? And so the idea that there's going to be what vehicle is used, he could end the war tomorrow. He could just say, I'm out. But what agreement is ultimately reached depends upon Putin and uh, what he decides to do. But there, there is no possibility of him winning the war in Ukraine. He's already lost that war. Extreme Republicans are playing chicken with our national security, holding Ukraine's funding hostage to their extreme partisan border policies. If Putin takes Ukraine, he won't stop there. It's important to see the long run here. He's going to keep going. He's made that pretty clear. If Putin attacks a NATO ally, then we'll have something that we don't seek and that we don't have today, American troops fighting Russian troops. American troops fighting Russian troops if he moves into other parts of NATO. Okay, Mr. President, which is it? Did he, did he lose already, or is there a possibility he can win? And where did you get the idea that he wants to attack other countries? He just wants NATO out of Ukraine, like we would want Chinese missiles out of Mexico. Get that feeling, Mr. President? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's pretty crazy that uh, they the intel people and even his his own advisors can't read uh, what's in the open media and read the words that Putin has said and look at. We have 21 months of war experience. Why don't we look and see if has Putin been telling the truth about his objective um, or has he not? Has he been consistent about what he says about his objectives or not? There's your source of information. This is what the rest of the world is looking at. They're not they're not trusting Putin. But if you hear Putin's not keeping secrets here. He said exactly what the problem was. He said he didn't want to do this, but he had to because NATO was coming to Ukraine. And that was a red line, which everyone knew, including including our own people who said it. It's been publicly stated by our State Department. Yeah, that was a red line. We knew that. Um, so uh, this is not a mysterious problem. Who's who is feeding uh our insane president, uh, his words, because um, it's obviously he's not functioning mentally and he's repeating stuff that he's being told. None of it makes any sense. Again, fits right in with the lot, you know, the total lack of credibility that we see in our country in a, in a wide area, not just Ukraine, but our own president is incompetent. There's uh, President Putin in the West Bank. Look at this. One of the honor guards caps comes off. And a very competent, oh. confident, and gracious Vladimir Putin picks the cap up. <laughs> there it is again. Uh, we'll show you a clip of uh, President Putin uh, caught unawares at a cocktail party. Compare that. You'll see it in a second, Karen. I have oh. to read the uh, subtitles. Compare the President Putin you're about to see to the President Biden that we just saw. 
Our defense plants are working more and more completely. Our industry is gaining momentum. We've started producing several times more. I know that we still don't have enough, but Ukraine is running out of weapons. They don't have their own foundations. When you don't have your own foundations, you don't have your own ideology, you don't have your own industry, you don't have your own money. You don't have anything that's your own, but you don't have a future. We have a future. Quite a yeah. difference between Vladimir yeah. and Joe. I'll give you the last word on all this, Karen. Well, I mean, Putin has, is running for president again, much, much like Joe Biden. Except Putin has an 80% popularity in his country, um, if you can believe their polls. And if you can believe our polls, uh, Biden is, is at the bottom. He's, he's 40%, hovering around 40%. Many Democrats um, do not want him to be their candidate. And he's refused a uh, Democratic primary so that we won't have, the Democrats won't have a choice as to who their candidate is. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is not, a, a, if you're an American, we, we're Americans, we're proud of our country, we love our country. This is not just embarrassing, this is humiliating um, to see how far our country has fallen in many ways. And, and Biden is, is a figurehead of that, of that uh, certainly foreign policy failures. Karen uh, Kwiatkowski, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll uh, hope you can Thank come you. back at your usual time, usual day next week. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Of course.